Well, hello and welcome to session number five. Probably not at all what you were expecting. Am I right? You know, when we're talking about joy, I would be amiss if I didn't bring you here, yes, to a cemetery. <laughs> and here's why. There's no greater picture in my mind that I have when I think of loss and sorrow. Sometimes we get wrapped up in this concept that joy is only active and fun and flirty and colorful and bright. But today I want to jump into something much deeper that we need to know about our friend Joy. Joy is there to comfort in the deepest of sorrows. She won't let you cry alone and she won't let you cry for long. Let's get right to it. I'm gonna rise up from the grave. I'm just always afraid. I feel like you should sing that in the graveyard, but that's okay. I don't know why. It's just I have emotional displacement disorder, and that's not a real thing. I made it up, but. So now you're back from outer space. Well, for the one that's watching this, that is my biggest cynic in the room and the most skeptical person. I want you to perk your ears up and listen in because this one is especially for you. You know, in John 10, 10, that we first discussed in our first session, it said very clearly that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the fullest or have it more abundantly. The reality is, is when you are looking for a life that's more abundant, sure, you're going to laugh more and you're going to have those moments where you laugh it up. But I also know that you're going to cry more tears as well. Abundant living is filled with a full range of emotions. And thank God that our emotions aren't what drive us to the center of joy. But it's Jesus himself. You know, we cannot base our entire lives off of what we feel. And Joy, I wanted to show you something different about her. She's not always jovial. She's not always running around, playing on a playground, and she's not always at the water park on the biggest slide. Sometimes Joy is your friend in the deepest, darkest hour in need that you will ever experience. And how do I know this to be true? Well, there's a great story in the Bible that you're going to be surprised that we're going to jump into and, and talk about in this type of session right now, because you're thinking, first off, why are we getting so down? Debbie Downer moment. Well, <laughs> I want you to see very clearly how God intends for you to have joy, even in the midst of life's craziest, darkest circumstances. Job is somebody perfect to look at for that example. For a long time as a child, when I heard the story of Job, I thought Satan came to God and said to him, hey, let me have it, this guy Job. You're giving him everything he wants and he's going to love you regardless what you do to his life. And so let me have a go at him. But the reality is when you read the scriptures, which is part of your homework this week, you have to read the whole book of Job. I'm going to have you discover that really it was God that brought Job to light. He said, hey, have you considered my servant Job? There is none righteous like he is. Now Satan rebuttaled and said, of course he's righteous because he has everything he needs or wants. He's a wealthy man. People come from all around to gain his advice and wisdom. Of course he's not going to turn his back when you're giving him everything that he has. The story goes on, and God was the one that allowed some tragedy to befall Job. <laughs> and that in and of itself, if we just stop there and that's all of the story, 
I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to leave with a lot of more questions than you have answers. So you have to read the whole book. Let me summarize it as best as I can in a small time frame. Basically, Job, in one afternoon, finds out he's lost all of his children, all of his wealth, every possession that he's had. And then in a couple days later, he finds out that his health has also been taken away from him. And he's reduced to sitting on top of a pile of rubble and ash. And he's finding himself with many questions about the God that he once so loved and was faithful to and the integrity he held on to for all of his life. Three friends come to gather around him and for seven days, they all stay quiet. Nobody speaks a word, not even Job. We would do well if we stopped there to just learn how to bring joy to people and comfort them in their sorrow. Sometimes joy looks like silence in the midst of tragedy. Sometimes joy best looks like when you're there and you're sitting calmly and you're sharing the moment and grieving with somebody who's grieving instead of offering advice they never asked for. You know, Job didn't, he didn't stay silent for very long either. And when he decided to speak up, he didn't keep his opinions and his, his curiosities about why God had allowed this to happen to himself either. You know, he says almost everything in the book that you can think of when tragedy hits. He said, God, why did you allow me to continue to live knowing that you were going to take everything from me? Why was I even born? Here he is thinking suicidal thoughts and his friends tell him, hey, 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 don't blame God. Blame yourself. Something's wrong. Something's hidden there. Some sin. We think about these three friends and how they talk to Job. And then one of the younger friends, Elihu, that doesn't even talk the entire time until chapter 39, 38. He said, you know what? I'm younger than the rest of you guys. So I've kept quiet thinking those of you that had age would have more wisdom. But you haven't said anything wise to our friend Job. So I'm going to chime in right now. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me. And Elihu, he... He flips the script. He says, don't neglect the foundation you know about the Lord himself, that he is a God that can do anything that he wants, and he is in charge of this entire world always, and he will do good. He will restore. He was the first person that spoke up and spoke hope in the middle of Job's tragedy. Elihu is our greatest example in the entire book of Job for somebody that was bringing joy in the midst of sorrow. Now, right after Elihu speaks up and says his share, I would expect that Job would rebuttal what he has to say because that's kind of been the back and forth that we've seen throughout the entire book. But instead, after Elihu speaks, we hear from God. And God starts speaking to Job for the first time. He's broken his silence. And everything that he's saying to Job is reminding him that he is God and he's in control of the earth and Job isn't. And not only that, he says flat out, your behavior, whether good or bad, hasn't affected my decision on what happened to your life. That's something we could learn well from right now, is that your behavior, good or bad, has no effect on what happens in our life and what God says yes or no to. In Psalms, it says very clearly, 115, the Lord is in the heavens and does what pleases him. He's God. He's sovereign. That word sovereign I really have tried for many years to think of a really wise, awesome definition for it. <laughs> and the thing is, is I was schooled by a seventh grade girl that I was leading as a group counselor at a summer camp. I said to them, all right, I need all to try to think of a good definition for the word sovereign and give it to me. And this little seventh grade, 13 year old girl chimes up and says, um, Miss Candace, I think I've got a good definition. Uh, I said, well, let's have it. And she was looking at the word written down. And she said, when you look at the word sovereign, if you share the O and you share the R, it looks like it says, so over rain. She goes, I guess the best description that I can think of is that God so over rains me. 